Morning, everyone. Thank you for being with us today. Uh, as Laurel mentioned, my name is Danny Connors with BDC, the Business Centre Manager for Bid Market Businesses in Nova Scotia. BDC is proud to be a sponsor of the Nova Scotia Business Summit, and I'm glad to be here today on behalf of our BDC team. Entrepreneurs are the engine of our economy. They build businesses, they create jobs, and make a difference in their communities every single day. BDC is the bank for Canadian entrepreneurs. We lend to and advise businesses from all walks of life and all stages of growth. It's my pleasure today to introduce our keynote speaker, Aaron Burry, an expert in technology and marketing, as well as the co-founder and CEO of her own startup, Willful. Aaron's presentation is called How Technology is Changing Legacy Industries and Processes from the Ground Up. In recent years, digital technology has touched every industry, from hospitality to transportation to finance, and has made companies rethink traditional ways of doing things. COVID-19 has further accelerated the shift to digital. Consumer purchasing has moved online, employees are increasingly working remotely, and business development is being done virtually. Through the pandemic, many businesses have had to shift the way they do business. At BDC, we encourage and work with business owners to take advantage of technology. So Aaron's message today is an important one as we look towards the recovery. But it's my distinct pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker. Aaron Burry is an entrepreneur, marketer, technology journalist, and startup advisor. Aaron is the co-founder and CEO at Willful, an online estate planning platform. Prior to this, she was the managing director at 88, a creative communications agency and managing director at a startup publication, Betiket. A journalism graduate, Aaron has written for publications such as The Globe and Mail, Mashable, Venture Beat, and is currently a monthly columnist with the Financial Post. Not only has Aaron been named one of Marketing Magazine's top 30 under 30, her claim to fame is that she's been retweeted by Oprah twice. In her spare time, Erin runs the side hustle, the County Wine Tours, a bicycle wine tour company. She also advises multiple startups and is a board of member for Save the Children Canada. After Erin's presentation, I'll be moderating a Q&A. So if you have any questions during the presentation, feel free to put them in the Q&A chat box and we can ask Erin afterwards. With that, please welcome Erin Bird. Thank you so much, Danny. I appreciate that extremely kind intro, and I'm very excited to be here today. I am coming to you from Toronto, so it's a little bit earlier and a pretty gray day today, but I hope it's sunny where you are. Uh, I have to share my fun fact, uh, not the Oprah fun fact, but my other work from home tip, which is this Ember mug. Uh, I'm obsessed with it. It's a mug that uh, is controlled by an app and keeps your coffee hot. So even if I don't drink it for the next hour while I'm talking to you, it'll be piping hot when I go back to it. So there's your little work from home tip for the day. So I'm going to share my screen now. As Danny mentioned, please pop any questions into the chat. I'd love to hear from you. Uh, you can also add uh, questions directly to the Q&A tab. You can upvote them so that Danny has a clear uh, view of which questions are the top ones uh, when we get to the Q&A. But for the next 45 minutes or so, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, exactly what Danny said, which is how we can embrace technology and innovation uh, and some great entrepreneurial stories from COVID. So uh, I will get started with sharing my screen. And if anyone can't see my screen, maybe just uh, tell me uh, via audio because I don't know that I'll be able to, uh, to see on the chat. So you should be seeing a slide that says how tech is changing legacy industries and how you can keep up. So uh, Danny gave me a wonderful intro, so I don't really need to tell you anything else about myself other than uh, I love pizza and the Fast and Furious franchise. So those are some personal details. Um, but I do want to highlight that I never saw myself being an entrepreneur. My parents worked at Nortel, uh, you know, they, they worked for a big corporation. And so when I went to journalism school, really my goal was to graduate and go work at a fortune 500 company. And my ultimate dream was to have a corner office. It was only after being recruited into a startup that I fell in love with the startup space and, uh, really haven't turned back since then. I also did not think going to journalism school that I would be on the cover of Canadian Lawyer Magazine, uh, but uh, I'll tell you a little bit about the backstory behind our company because I think it illustrates one of my points later. Uh, but su suffice to say that that has been a, an achievement of my career to be on the cover of a magazine, even though 17 year old me would be like, what, Canadian Lawyer? Uh, but I wanted to start with this question of, is your business ready for the future? I think if COVID has taught us anything in life and in business, it's that we need to be thinking ahead and we need to be prepared for the unexpected and be open to adapting to change. 
But before I dive into this, I'm going to answer the question that I know is on your mind, which is, what the heck did Oprah retweet? Um, so I'll tell you the story. It was back, it must have been 2010, 2011, so almost a decade ago. Uh, I was and still am very into Twitter. And it was when Oprah's network own was launching in Canada. And so I tweeted, you know, kind of making fun of her when she gave away the cars, you get a car, you get a car. So I tweeted, you know, own launches in Canada today, today, everybody gets own. And she retweeted it. And uh, it was one of those moments where my timeline just started exploding. And I had to call my mom and tell her, oh, my God, Oprah retweeted me. Uh, but sadly, uh, we are we have not spoken since we are not BFFs. I have not replaced Gail, but I do have at least the screenshots to prove it. So there you go. Uh, my claim to fame. Uh, so now let's get back to that question of is your business ready for the future? And I want to start with a story about this gentleman. His name is Stephen Sasson. And he is a longtime worker at the Kodak company, the camera company. And back in the mid 70s, he actually invented the first digital camera. Now, it was about the size of what he's holding there. So it was not the digital cameras that you or I may recognize, even though we all use our cameras as phones today. Uh, but an interesting thing happened when Stephen uh, brought this to his bosses at Kodak. You know, he thought he would walk into a boardroom and he would say, I invented this amazingly innovative device and it's going to change the way we take photos and it's big now, but you know, in, in 20 years, I'm going to, I'm going to work on it. I'm going to reduce the size. I'm going to make sure that it's more consumer friendly. And he thought that Kodak would receive it as kind of heralded as the next big thing at the company. But it, a different thing happened, which was he got a very lukewarm response. And this is documented in a really interesting New York Times article about uh, about this whole process. His bosses were not that excited for a few reasons. Number one, he was giving them a 20 year timeline and most of them were thinking, well, I'm not even going to be an executive at this company in 20 years. So this just seems like too far of a time horizon. But the biggest reason they were lukewarm is because Kodak's main business model at the time and into the 90s was not only selling cameras, but selling film to go in those cameras. And if you're watching under the age of 30, you might say, what the heck is she talking about? Uh, but if you're older than that, you remember buying film canisters and putting film in your camera. And they also monetized getting that film developed. So going to your corner store uh, or you know grocery store and getting your film developed and paying for that. So they had three big revenue streams. And here was someone telling them, we're going to eliminate two of those. With this camera, you won't need to buy film. You won't need to get film developed. And so it really scared the executives because it questioned this business model that they had been so used to for so long. But they said, you know what, Stephen, keep working on it and, and come, you know, gave him permission to kind of go off in a corner and work on uh, reducing the size and increasing the efficacy of this camera. So 20 years later, like clockwork in the early 90s, uh, Stephen came back to a different room of executives and said, you know, I've finally done it. I've, I've shrunk in the camera. Technology has advanced enough where we've been able to put this into a much smaller device. And it's now ready to go uh, to be sold to consumers. We can actually launch this as a product. And again, he was expecting this big fanfare. And instead, you know, Kodak's executives were kind of the same. Like, we, why would we launch this? Consumers are never going to take photos with a digital camera. No one's going to change their behavior. Kind of the same thing I thought when I heard about digital cameras. Like, no, I love film. I love developing it. I love the surprise. But of course, consumer behavior changes. And so those executives who were pretty lukewarm about it, you know, they still pursued patents on the camera, but they decided not to commercialize it. So instead, companies like Fujifilm ended up being the first to market with a, a digital camera for consumers, even though Steven Sasson had been the innovator and the pioneer behind the technology. And Kodak owned the patent on this camera until the mid 2000s when it expired and then you know their money maker because people had been paying them to use the patents ran out and by then they had just become a follower not a leader in the digital camera space uh, and as you know they they ended up filing for bankruptcy so i think this is just such a great story that illustrates that you can have innovative thinkers within your organization you can have innovative ideas but if you don't have a culture 
of seeing into the future, of being able to embrace change and foster it, and to anticipate shifts in consumer behavior, it's all moot. And I think we've seen a lot of that. I don't know if anyone else has watched the last blockbuster on Netflix, but growing up, blockbuster was such a ritual for me to go and rent movies. And uh, it was one of those companies that just seemed like it could never fail. They had thousands of stores across the US and Canada, uh, but they just didn't anticipate quickly enough the shift to streaming. And apparently, according to the documentary, they also had a chance to buy Netflix and uh, didn't take that opportunity. And as you know, Netflix is now the behemoth and Blockbuster has one lone location in Bend, Oregon. And that's the same across many of these companies where they just didn't anticipate a shift or didn't react quickly enough to it. And they thought that people would do things the way that they had always done them. And in fact, if you actually look at the Fortune 500, only about 12% of the companies on the Fortune 500 in 1955 were still on the list in 2017. So there's this natural cycle that happens with businesses where they just end up kind of becoming obsolete because they're not able to adapt as quickly. Now, this isn't all companies, of course. Companies like General Electric have been around for you know a century, but uh, a lot of companies, the reason they fail isn't that they're not great businesses. It's that they just can't adapt to change. So with that lens, uh, knowing that you're all business owners in, I'm sure, very different industries, and of course, please pop an intro to yourself and your business into the chat so all the other attendees know what you do. Uh, but with that in mind, what does today's consumer care about? You know, if uh, if 1999's consumer cared about digital cameras and shifting their behavior, if 2008's consumer cared about trying out this newfangled thing called the iPhone and using apps for the first time, what does 2021's consumer care about, especially in the context of COVID? Well, the first thing is mobile and on-demand everything. So that means, you know, easy, intuitive mobile experiences. It means instant gratification. So if you live in a rural part of Nova Scotia, then you probably uh, can't get something to your door within a couple hours. But living in, in Toronto, you know, if I want flowers delivered, groceries, booze, anything I want to my front door, I can get it in a matter of hours, thanks to services like Uber Eats and a bunch of other startups that have or really Amazon, who can deliver pretty much anything to me the next day. So consumers have this sense of instant gratification, where if they're being shipped something, if they want something, they're able to satisfy that demand right away. There is this idea of mobile first, desktop second. So we used to really focus on the website first as the main destination when we were visiting a business and learning more about it. Now I would argue, not only are we starting on our mobile phone, but we're also starting outside the website. We're looking people up on social media. We're seeing their profiles there before we ever visit the business's website. So the behavior of finding a business and, uh, and you know, researching them has really shifted from starting at the website to ending up at the website. And then, oh, there was a missing one here. So uh, I must have had a great thought that I didn't put in there. The second thing that today's consumers care about is social community. And I think this has become, this used to say social and offline community. Obviously that's been updated due to COVID, but we've never relied more heaven, heavily on our online communities. Now this is a double-edged sword. On one hand, it means that we're doom scrolling social media and we might be getting stressed and anxious from what we're seeing on our phones. But on the other hand, it means that we've been able to find community and companionship in a time where we haven't been able to do that as much in person. Now, I know on the East Coast, the restrictions have been lighter, which is amazing. A, an entrepreneur friend of mine in Toronto is actually moving to Nova Scotia uh, next month because they're just, you know, like, why, if I can work from anywhere, why the heck wouldn't I work from one of the most beautiful provinces in, uh, in Canada? So it's really interesting to see also how remote work is affecting trends uh, in Canada. But in terms of social community, you know, if we were social media power users before, 
were now that on steroids. And I would argue that folks who maybe were reticent to try social media before or who didn't gravitate towards it, maybe elderly folks or people who just, you know, weren't into it, they've been almost forced into it to use FaceTime with family members or to, you know, be on WhatsApp so that they can keep up with what's going on with their family when they can't necessarily see them in person. We also look to social media for brand touch points. So, you know, if we are interested in purchasing a product, I'm likely to head over to the Instagram page and look at comments and reviews, uh, or maybe I find out about brands from an ad on Facebook or TikTok or Instagram. Uh, so social media not only becomes a place for us to connect with other people, it becomes a place for us to connect with brands through influencers, ads, and, uh, and the company's pages themselves. And I would say during COVID, we've seen such a rush to support small business that actually it's never been a better time to be a small business on social media because there's such an outpouring of support, which is really great to see. And we also belong to so many online communities. You know, I belong to online communities for my gym, which I can't go to in person, but I can do online classes and connect with my fellow fitness fans. I belong to communities for professional public speakers and for people in my neighborhood in Liberty Village in Toronto and for, you know, a whole host of other things. And that's across Facebook and other communities, Facebook primarily. So I think uh, as a business owner, I always think about how can you relevantly get involved in those online communities, either because you belong to them yourself, because you live in the local community or because you have those interests, uh, but also your customers are definitely hanging out in those types of groups. So it's, it stands to bear that there could be a really great strategy to, to connect with them there. And then finally, valuing and following influencers. I think influencers have gotten a little bit of a bad rap during COVID because unfortunately some of them have, you know, taken money from Air Canada to travel during these times and, you know, have made some questionable choices. But there's no doubt that uh, we look to social influencers like we used to look to celebrities 20 or 30 years ago. And there are so many influencers who probably have millions of followers that are in your target demographic. So as a business, uh, it's also interesting to think about how can I uh, have an influencer strategy to be able to, con to, to connect with these people uh, via these thought leaders. And then experience is not things. I think this has been a trend for quite a while. And to be honest, during COVID, maybe hasn't been as feasible because experiences have been kind of limited, especially travel. But this specifically has been well documented for millennials and, and younger. I myself am an older millennial. I'm almost 36, but I can certainly say that I've always had a focus on spending money on travel and experiences. And when I talk to folks who run ski resorts or golf clubs, you hear all the time that the younger audiences are just not buying these status symbol memberships or possessions as much as previous generations. And I think after COVID, that's going to be even more prevalent. Uh, you're also seeing some interesting trends like renting, right? And I don't mean renting homes. I mean, renting power tools from the power tool library in Toronto. I mean, uh, renting dresses. Uh, there's a company called Rent Frock Repeat. And every time I have a wedding, I just order a dress from them to wear and then I send it back. There's this idea of not necessarily having to own things. We even see that with our multimedia. Do we own any of the multimedia we're watching on Netflix or any of the songs in our Spotify? No, we're okay with renting that and just using it for a fee. There's also been, of course, the rise of peer-to-peer -peer apps. When I used to be able to travel, I would rent cars on Turo, which is a peer-to-peer -peer car rental app, instead of going to enterprise rent-a-car, for example. And of course, we've seen Airbnb actually explode during the pandemic with local travel, and I'm sure you've definitely seen that in Nova Scotia. Uh, spending on experiences, like I mentioned, younger generations specifically are more fo less focused on materialism and minimalism has become such a big trend thanks to Marie Kondo and, uh, and all of the minimalist documentaries on Netflix. And then obviously we've, we've seen an explosion in the trend of remote work and digital nomads. So there's really this idea that, well, if I can work from anywhere, I'm going to pick a place that has a lower cost of living or that has better weather. I don't need to be tethered to an office anymore. I can design my life 
Um, and actually there is this massive digital nomad community of people who just move around the world and don't have a home base. And I think we'll see that even more post COVID when obviously companies are more open to remote work. So I really think about it this way. If you are targeting a consumer today, uh, or even if you think about your own expectations as a consumer, you expect the wide selection that Amazon has where you can find anything at your fingertips, the immediacy of Uber where you can hail a car in two minutes, the simplicity of a company like Wealthsimple where there's beautiful user design and, and extremely simple uh, UX, and the types of community that you get on Instagram. So this is really the pinnacle of what today's consumer expects. And that's tough if you're a small business to figure out how do I tackle all of these uh, elements. So if today's consumer is different, if things have really shifted because of COVID, uh, how do we actually adapt our businesses to cater to those expectations? So I'm going to walk through kind of four uh, ways that technology has disrupted uh, business and then talk, speak about a couple stories to illustrate each and then give you some tips just on how you can apply these learnings or shifts to your own business and hopefully you walk away with a few questions to bring back to the team a few things to reflect on uh, and hopefully some inspirations from some really great small business stories during covid so the first thing that we've really seen uh, with technology is that it's disrupted legacy industries and I promised I would tell you a little bit of the backstory of Willful because it's definitely relevant here. So uh, this uh, gentleman on the screen is my husband, Kevin, who's also my co-founder, uh, his uncle, Dave. And unfortunately, Dave passed away unexpectedly a few years ago. And, you know, if you've gone through the loss of a loved one, you know that there's often a lot of unanswered questions about, you know, specifically in our case, funeral wishes, burial plans, where important papers were stored. And even though he had been married to Kevin's aunt Nancy for over 30 years, he had never discussed any of these things. So as we were sitting there arguing with family members and trying to hunt down all of this information, Kevin, who's always been very entrepreneurial, thought to himself, you know, there's got to be a better way. Uh, we're all going to pass away at some point. We're all going to deal with uh, wrapping up the life of a loved one. Why is this process so paper based? Why are people so reticent to talk about it? Um, so really, he set out to build a company that would make it more accessible, uh, affordable and uh, digital to actually build out an estate plan and share end of life wishes with family. Uh, so. The company is willful, as you can guess. Uh, we have been live since October of 2017. We are available in Nova Scotia and as well as uh, seven other provinces, including Quebec, which we launched a couple weeks ago. And really the goal has been to, uh, you know, kind of reshape this experience that typically exists in the legal space, which is I need a legal service. So I make an appointment. I leave my home. I go into a lawyer's office. I pay a very expensive hourly rate. Um, and in some cases, like a will, if I have a simple situation, I'm getting a document that is pretty templated um, that might be customized slightly, but that doesn't feel like it's being created from the ground up for me. Uh, and that's probably true of a, lot of a lot of other legal services as well. The challenge with the legal space in general is that they're just so reticent to change. Um, lawyers are traditionally, and this is a generalization, so obviously it's not true across the board, but they're generally not as willing to adopt technology either because they come from an older generation who, you know, they've been doing things the same time, way for a long time, um, or because it's threatening, right? Well, if I start using technology, will it replace aspects of my job? Will I still be able to, to run my practice the same way? Uh, so we've definitely faced a lot of pushback from lawyers who uh, don't like technology, who don't think that it's the future of, of the legal space, but we look at ourselves as consumers who are 35, 36 years old, and this is the type of experience that we expect, right? We expect digital, we expect to be able to do things online from home for an affordable price with a really user friendly design. Um, and so we're not trying to replace lawyers, we're really just trying to complement them and to target the unfortunately 16 million Canadian adults who don't have uh, a will or power of attorney in place. So uh, in the legal tech space specifically, there's been a lot of companies in the US and in Canada who have taken these kind of 
templated uh, processes and moved them online and not cut lawyers out of the equation. We work with lawyers uh, in Truro, actually, in Nova Scotia. Uh, shout out to Callback May. Uh, but in every province, lawyers are still an integral part of the process, but it's just looking at how we interact with lawyers in a much different way. And we've seen that in other aspects. Oh, this is just a view of what we achieved last year. So uh, go small business. Uh, We've also seen a lot of uh, legal change. So it's been interesting in that uh, COVID has precipitated a lot of forced change in industries. And if you're in a traditional industry, you probably could tell me five stories about how governments or regulators have had to speed up. Because when COVID hit, uh, it's mandatory in anywhere in Canada that you have to sign a will on paper and you also have to get together with two witnesses who don't benefit from your will. So all of a sudden people were saying, well, how am I supposed to get this important task done while respecting social distancing and staying inside my bubble? So the government has responded. And I don't know that there's any change in Nova Scotia, unfortunately, yet. Uh, but the government in Ontario and other provinces like BC and Saskatchewan have allowed for things like virtual witnessing of wills, and they're considering kind of longer term change. So what we've really seen is that these legacy industries are either being forced to change through companies like ours that are moving processes online, whether they want them to go online or not, or we've seen COVID just completely accelerate the pace of change from the inside out by probably a decade, which is, in my opinion, a really good thing. Uh, in terms of other legal tech companies, so there's a company called Founded in Toronto that also brings the incorporation process online for uh, incorporating a business that helps you manage employee contracts and things like that. Again, really templated things that aren't customized, improve through technology. Uh, there's even a company called Undo that is making divorce simpler. So you can actually go online and get a divorce uh, with Undo without having to, uh, to go into the lawyer. So um, there you go. Uh, you can do it, uh, truly do it all online. We've seen this across so many industries, including, I'm sure, yours. So what does this actually mean for you that these traditional legacy industries are really being disrupted by technology? Well, it means that aspects of your product or service may be replaced by software or a digital product. And that's true if you are a product company or a service business. I used to run a marketing agency and I would have folks all the time that would say, well, I'll just use Canva to design this stuff or I'll use Fiverr to find a logo designer instead of hiring you and paying you a lot of money for it. Um, it's not it's it's professional services that are being disrupted and digitized and automated as well as uh, products themselves. A startup is probably already working on or already offers the product version of what you offer. And it means that every legacy industry is being disrupted. In Canada specifically, you know, it's not just legal tech, it's fintech, which is one of the hottest spaces in the tech space, um, and so many others that are really seeing a lot of disruption from, from tech and innovation. So how can you respond? Well, first, Assess whether software can replace aspects of your service or product. What is templated? What is repeatable? What do you have stored in a Microsoft Word document that you use every single time? Can you actually use software to replace that? Maybe in my example of Willful, if I'm a lawyer, maybe I'm looking for B2B software that allows me to automate part of my process so that can, my clients can get a really tech-enabled onboarding uh, process. Research who the willful of your industry is. You know, there is a startup working on improving whatever aspect of your, your service or product. Um, and I think the natural tendency is to think of these as competitive instead of as complementary, right? Maybe they're a strategic partner. Like we work with lawyers in each of these provinces. And when we have a customer in Nova Scotia who is not the right fit for our platform because it's, it only caters to simple estates, we can send it over to Jessica at Callback May and be a source of referrals for her uh, and a source of business. And then finally, what are the consumer's existing pain points? You know, I always talk about the pain points with wills in terms of the three C's, convenience, cost, complexity. What are the, your consumer's existing pain points? What do they hate 
about going through your, if you're a mortgage broker, what do they hate about the mortgage application process? If you're a financial planner, what aspect of that is really, really annoying for them, whether it's compiling their assets or answering your questionnaire. Um, so start to think about the existing pain points that exist and how you might be contributing to uh, solving them. So the second shift that we've really seen is with business models. And this is, again, based on that shift in consumer behavior. Consumers are renting things, not owning them. They're renting things from other people like Airbnb, renting other people's homes or Uber, riding in a car with another person as the driver. So we've really seen that business models have been disrupted a lot. And one of the earliest examples that I saw of this and one of my favorite stories is about Dollar Shave Club. So, uh, you know, razors were pretty traditional industry. You would go to your pharmacy, you would feel like a criminal because you'd, you know, have to ask them to open up the glass for the, uh, the, the razors and they're expensive, right? Uh, and so this entrepreneur named Michael Dubin, he, uh, for some reason, had a, a friend's dad had a surplus of, you know, 10,000 disposable razors. He was an importer, exporter. And Michael said, you know what, I could probably sell those. And so he had a background in improv and he uh, decided to make this viral video, which you can Google on YouTube if you haven't seen it, Dollar Shave Club. It's really, really hilarious. But he took this totally different approach to selling razors, both, both in the business model, but also in the marketing. So typically you see ads like this, whereas, uh, as I'll show you, his advertising is... Uh, I won't show the video because I, I don't want to uh, mess up the internet connection, but you can Google that uh, on YouTube. Uh, but, you know, he uses this really irreverent tone. He talk, you know, uses a bit of swearing and kind of pushes the uh, the edge of what is acceptable for a consumer product marketing. And a company like, you know, Chic or Gillette would just never have been able to do that. They're, they're big corporate companies. They have a set advertising formula. And it certainly doesn't include using the F word on posters in your advertising. Um, and he also took, Michael Dubin took a different approach to the business model. So again, the business model of razors has always been buy the, the, the razor itself and then replace the blades, like the printer and ink model, unless you were buying the really cheap disposables. And so Michael Dubin said, well, why don't we just launch a subscription service where you order the razors from us and then we ship you the replacements on a monthly basis and we know exactly, you know, you tell us how often you shave and then we send you exactly the right number of blades. So you never have to rush out to the pharmacy again. You never have to feel like the criminal opening the, the glass case um, and it's super simple. So that's what he did. He launched this company. The video went viral. I think it has over 25 million views on YouTube now. Uh, and it really launched this trend of monthly subscription businesses. And so uh, in terms of what happened to Michael Dubin, he ended up selling his company for $1 billion to Unilever, which was obviously a, a pretty crazy outcome for this really small business um, and this kind of new way of thinking. And now subscription businesses are pretty common. I actually have a floss subscription, a dental floss subscription where it arrives at my door every month. And I'm sure there's, uh, you've tried a subscription box for something over the years. Uh, another interesting business model shift I've seen during COVID is for uh, events. So obviously, um, you know, we can't go to conferences, we're doing them online, which is actually great in some ways, because we can connect with speakers and people from uh, all over the world. But what about company events? You know, as a small business owner during COVID, I really had to struggle to think, how are we actually going to engage our team members and make sure that we're connected in this virtual world? And a friend of mine started a company called Wavy a couple of years ago, and Wavy was focused on helping consumers find local things in their cities, beer tastings and, you know, great concerts and things like that. Well, as soon as COVID hit, Sean, the founder, said, well, um, no one's doing anything. So I, I, I'm going to pivot because I identify this niche with virtual events, specifically for companies. Every company was trying to figure out, okay, do we host virtual game nights? What do we do? So Wavy has completely pivoted to 
uh, real life experiences made virtual. They offer kind of corporate team building events virtually. They host everything. They send you the physical packages. We did our, our holiday party with them. We just did a French wine tasting uh, and cheese tasting to celebrate our launch in Quebec. Uh, and they do a fantastic job with making it engaging. But the interesting part of it is that they're turning corporate events into a subscription business model where they're saying, listen, you're going to be remote or at least hybrid in your workforce for the next for the foreseeable future. And for some companies like Shopify forever, apparently. So pay for a subscription buy you know, 12, six or 12 events from us, pay you know, a monthly amount for access to this number of events throughout the year, and we'll help host them for you. So I thought that was a really interesting example of a new way of thinking, uh, it, uh, not only a pivot in the core business, but also this really interesting business model that probably wouldn't have existed you know, five or 10 years ago. And here's a, a lovely photo of us doing our cocktail tasting on Zoom. So we've seen a bunch of examples of interesting business models emerge through COVID. I've seen gyms that are renting out equipment at home or streaming classes. I now pay for virtual classes instead of in-person. We've seen restaurants providing at-home cocktails and meal experiences. I've seen a pest control company in Toronto that pivoted to being a sanitization company for condo buildings. And of course, we've seen distilleries that are producing hand sanitizer or personal protective equipment. So uh, people have really been forced to shift their business model, leveraging technology during COVID. And my guess is that it's not always gonna go back to the way it was. Wavy will probably always be doing virtual events because it means that their clients can be anywhere in the world. And most companies will have a hybrid model. Same with gyms. If you've been doing at-home workouts, you probably, don't want to leave your house to go to the gym again, or maybe not as often as you used to before. And I, it brings me back to thinking about this Kodak story that I told earlier. I love this quote from technologist Clayton Christensen. The reason why it's so difficult for existing firms to capitalize on disruptive innovations is that their processes and their business model that makes them good at the existing business actually makes them bad at competing for the disruption. So this is exactly like Kodak that new business model of selling digital cameras competed with their existing business model of selling film and developing film. So they just didn't do it. I think about this with lawyers too. They're, they monetize through an hourly rate. So something like Willful, which is a software product and a, a one-time software fee is just so antithetical to the way that they do business today. So what does it mean for you that business models are changing? means that you could look at a new business model for your own business. Uh, you know, could you offer a subscription? Whether you're a wavy and you're only offering virtual services or whether you're offering a physical product. What about software as a service, which is very hot right now? Or rentals, you know, could you actually make more? In that Blockbuster documentary, they talked about how the studios initially hated Blockbuster because uh, they were buying the, the videos and then renting the them to consumers and studios weren't making anything. They then shifted to a rev share where for every rental, the studio would earn a fee and it made the studios more money than they ever could have made through selling videos. So this idea of being open to rentals as a business model. What about freemium? Can you offer something for free and then upgrade people over time? We see that with companies like Dropbox where you get a certain amount of storage for free and then you upgrade over time. What about peer to peer? Um, you know, I, I don't know if there's an opportunity there for your business, but it is big right now. And then if you're in services, maybe value-based pricing. So in marketing, uh, not looking at the number of hours that it's gonna take, but charging based on the value that it's gonna provide to the end client. And then finally, loss leader products, you know, maybe Willful, for example, offers a free will in the future because we have the opportunity to build a relationship with the person and give them more products and services over time. Uh, so takeaway from today is make a list of how those business models could apply to your industry and offering. And I believe that we can hopefully send the slides around so you don't have to mad scramble to write them down. If you had to apply one of those new business models, maybe one of those stuck out to you, which one would make the most sense? And can you actually survey your customers to assess interest for how you could test a new way of charging? Maybe they'd love the idea of subscription monthly pricing because it evens out their payments instead of having, you know, 
larger payments infrequently. Uh, so commit to, con to surveying them and seeing how you can incorporate that. So something close to my heart, legacy marketing, and I am going to get close to the end because I know I want to leave time for questions. Uh, but just a, a couple quick stories about legacy marketing. You know, the way that we market products and services is just so different in 2021 than it was in 2011 and certainly that versus 2001. Uh, so I wanted to tell you a story about two of my friends, Sheba and Genevieve, who launched a company called Mahara. They launched it during the pandemic. Their original idea was to launch an events company where they would have mindfulness retreats. Uh, obviously, that was not possible. So they actually had to pivot right from the beginning and do something different. So they actually decided to launch a journal, a monthly meditation and mindfulness journal called the Human Being Journal, which I write in every month and love it. Um, but when they thought about launching this, really in-person wasn't an option, right? Everything's closed and traditional retail just wasn't an option. So they marketed completely through new channels. They marketed on Instagram. They stalked <laughs> in a nice way, not in a legal way, celebrities like Jessica Alba and other, these other celebrities like Reese Witherspoon, uh, some of whom ended up posting about it from the, to their millions of followers. Uh, they focused a lot on building a social media community, on running some ads on places like Instagram, uh, on trying out things like TikTok, and of course, on reaching out to digital media publications. Uh, they were actually in Oprah magazine. You know how I feel about Oprah. So that was pretty cool uh, earlier this year. So they launched this product during the pandemic and really because of the constraints provided by COVID, were forced into marketing exclusively online. And that is actually really common today. We're not seeing as many offline marketing tactics. We can't go to conferences. Uh, you know, we're not necessarily turning to direct mail or brochures or conferences as our first point of marketing. So it's all about how can you figure out where your consumer is hanging out online, where they're spending their time, and how you can integrate yourselves relevantly into that. And this doesn't matter if you're B2B or B2C. There's always a, a, a way to reach your target customer persona online. And, you know, Sheba and Genevieve have made it into Indigo. Um, so when stores open back up, it'll be pretty cool for them to be there. I might look a bit angelic right now. My <laughs> The sun just came out from behind a cloud. So I apologize if it's blinding you. And I wanted to give an example from my own life. So I think it's really easy when you hear about things like Clubhouse or TikTok to dismiss it to call it something that younger people are using and to say, oh, I don't have time for that. Uh, and I certainly was that way with TikTok. I was like, oh, this is for the youth. I'm 35, I'm not getting on TikTok. Uh, and I certainly didn't evaluate it for my business. But then during COVID, um, you know, we were all bored and looking for things to do. And so many people were sending me funny TikTok videos that I finally downloaded it. And after a few months of just lurking and looking at content, I realized there were so many professionals on TikTok from dental hygienists to nutritionists to personal trainers to personal finance experts and planners uh, who were leveraging TikTok for business. And I never saw one post about estate planning. So I set out to launch an experiment, which is, can I actually use TikTok to drive business for my online will platform? So I, you can look me up on TikTok, you can watch my videos, I put myself out there, I learned the memes, I did the dances and the lip syncing. And yes, it was super embarrassing, but at the same time, I didn't care as long as it could help me validate whether this was a good tool for our business. And within about six weeks of posting a bunch of these videos, I had over 200,000 views. You can see here that some of the videos had, one of them has 84,000 views, one of them has 24,000 views. Um, but more than that, I had so many comments on my videos about estate planning from people who were around my age, who had joined TikTok because of COVID, who were asking all about, you know, how to make a will. Uh, and so many of them were actually saying, I'm going to check out your website. And this is the email that did, you know, made me super happy. We got an email to our customer service that said, just to let you know, I contacted your business because of TikTok. So I think that's a really great case study to apply to your own business. There's probably a social network or a tool that you've dismissed because, you know, it's for the young people, uh, but you probably have staff or interns or people in your life, nieces, nephews, kids who are embracing these tools. So my challenge to you is to not dismiss them and to uh, and to, to remember that in 2021, it might be essential to to 
not only uh, provide a unique edge over your competitors who probably aren't using those platforms, but to find customers. And it's really about being where your customers are instead of expecting them to find you. And that might be on TikTok. Communicating with clients the way they prefer. Um, this is more for customer service. Do you have live chat options? Do you have email? Or are you going to force me to pick up the phone and call you, which I never, ever want to do? Are you leveraging social proof? Consumers today are all about reviews and word of mouth and referrals. So how are you actually leveraging that? And being open to trying new marketing channels. Uh, so really the challenge to you is to revisit your customer personas. Who is your customer? What, what are they buying? Um, and uh, what's their behavior? And interview a few of them. Where do they hang out online? What publications do they read? What online communities are they part of? And what new apps are they spending time on? So that you have a picture of where your customer spends time. Then list out any uh, offline or in-person marketing strategies you've employed and find an online alternative because at least until later this year, those just aren't going to be feasible. And create a social proof strategy. How can you leverage word of mouth from your existing clients, get them to refer folks, get them to leave reviews because that's so powerful in an online world. Uh, and of course, I'd be remiss to say that it's all about investing in the basics, making sure you have a mobile friendly website, making sure you do have a social media presence, even if you're not the one managing it. Um, it's key uh, in 2021. So finally, before I hand it over to Danny, I'm just going to quickly talk about legacy business processes. This is a quick one, but really, we all were forced into changing the way that we do things in 2020. I, you know, we had an in-office culture at Willful. We went into the office every day. We did have work from home flexibility, but for the most part, we were an in-office company. And because we were a tech company, we already used all of these services to run our business. So when it shifted uh, to remote work, we were pretty set up. We didn't really have to scramble to, to move online. But I know for some folks, especially government agencies and bigger companies, it was a real shock because they had been using paper for so long. They had all of these antiquated legacy processes that all of a sudden just weren't feasible with uh, remote work. Uh, so really the 2021 trends that I see in this space are a return to the office and hybrid workplaces. If 2020 was about going remote, 2021 is about creating a thoughtful approach to a return to the office or trying to manage hybrid workplaces. Now you might be going fully remote and this might be a moot point for you, but uh, for most there is going to be some sort of uh, hybrid experience. And how do you make sure that the folks who are remote have a similar experience, but more importantly, similar opportunities for advancement as those in office employees? One thing that I'm sure you've seen is streamlining video conferencing tools. You know, we all have fatigue switching from Cisco WebEx to Microsoft Teams to Zoom. Uh, so I think a lot of that will be streamlined and hopefully we won't have as many tools to switch between. Uh, and at Willful, we use something called Zapier, which connects multiple services. So if you're using all of these software platforms, for example, uh, Zapier will post a Slack message when we get a review on Google or Zapier will post a Slack message when uh, we receive a customer service email so we can read it. So things like that that connect all of your disparate online tools and make them work more for you. Uh, and finally, digitizing any remaining paper or offline processes if you haven't already. So the final takeaways are to review which software tools you've invested in since the start of COVID. Which ones did you have prior to COVID? Which ones are new? review whether you're using all of these platforms or if you're missing any, uh, and identifying which aspects of your business are still handled on paper. So with that, I'm going to hand it back over to Danny because I definitely want to leave time for, for questions and dialogue. I wanna say thank you so much for having me today next. And uh, I'm really excited to be talking to a group of small business owners like myself. So I will stop sharing and Danny and I can get into a dialogue. Yeah, thanks for that, Aaron. That was uh, fantastic. Lots of awesome examples there and a really, really great presentation. Uh, had a couple of questions rolling in here as you were chatting, a few things you sort of touched on throughout, but I want to go through the, the questions I have here. So the first one that came up, a lot of examples uh, you reference are uh, consumer-based product services. What lessons should more traditional industries like manufacturing and food processing uh, take away from your examples? Yeah, it's a great question. And when I ran a marketing agency previously, I worked with a lot of uh, B2B companies. So 
I, I absolutely think that there's a way to leverage a lot of the things that I've talked about, um, specifically automating processes and looking at sales tools. So if I'm B2B, my sales team is probably used to in-person sales calls. They are used to buying booths at trade shows, attend attending industry events. So B2B companies have really had to rethink how they find customers. And what I always say to people is, your target customer, the buyer at your target customer is a consumer first and foremost. So they are hanging out on TikTok. They are reading the Globe and Mail and other local publications. So uh, it's starting with that customer persona. Who is your customer? Is your customer the HR manager at a mid-sized company? Are they the CTO at a Fortune 500? Are they a small business owner like myself? And then kind of thinking about, okay, what are the ways that I could reach them? Yes, it may be different for B2B. You might invest more in LinkedIn, for example, and LinkedIn advertising. You might um, host some, some webinars, right? There's so many great digital platforms that I've seen a lot of B2B companies gravitate towards content marketing, thought leadership, and events over the last year, creating webinar series, creating uh, networking events so that they can bring people together in their industry and finding other ways to kind of replicate that in-person experience. Um, so there, it's definitely possible to leverage a lot of these ideas. And internally, I think um, a lot of these traditional industries are probably the ones that are most resistant to change just because, again, they have been doing things the same way. Um, the answer is we're not going backwards. We're only going forwards. And so if you have an executive team or if you have folks that are like the Kodak executive team and they really don't see those changes happening because they're not using TikTok in their personal life or they're not um, you know, on the ground with the marketing team, then you have a decision. How do I help to influence that change? How do I help to give them trend presentations to educate them on today's consumer habits? Or do I want to be in an environment where I'm just not going to get anywhere and it's going to feel like uh, butting my head against a wall, right? Um, so hopefully everyone is coming into this with an attitude of change. And, and I've seen so many companies who never would have gone to remote work, absolutely were traditional, and they've been completely forced to upend everything because of COVID. And a lot of them have been forced into adopting and embracing technology. And I don't think they would go back. So I think it's the right climate right now to, um, regardless of how traditional your industry is, regardless of B2B versus B2C, to uh, leverage that mindset of change that we all have to have right now. So hopefully that helps. And thanks for the question. Yeah, and a, maybe a follow-on to that because the, the next one is, is, is similar. Um, oh, uh, sorry here. What uh, what can traditional marketing, or sorry, traditional manufacturing companies take advantage of for digital options to grow a larger out of market client base? So similar question, but I guess if you're targeting out of market, what's you know what advice would you give to them? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, again, I would go back to the customer personas. Who are these out of market clients? Let's say, for example, you're targeting. Um, you've never targeted small business owners before, but you see them as an opportunity. Uh, we just participated in this accelerator program with Intuit, uh, the software company, and they have this approach to designing products and um, marketing strategies called Design for Delight. And it's all about this idea of customer empathy, which means that they spend a lot of time on follow me homes, which are interviews with customers. So if I was a manufacturing business and all of a sudden we said, you know what, um, we really wanna start targeting this completely new audience of customers. The first thing I would do is not, you know, start marketing to them. The first thing I would do is find 10 to 20 people that fit that customer base and either compensate them with Amazon gift card or something like that, or just ask them if they'll spend 30 to 60 minutes with you and interview them about where they spend their time, how they make their purchasing decisions. What is the procurement process like? How have they approached buying products and services like yours in the past? Who manages that relationship internally? So that's really where I would start is customer interviews and really deep customer empathy, finding the pain points that exist, and then building your value proposition around you being the person that can solve those pain points, and then moving to the phase where you're actually creating materials that can reach them, whether that is white papers, reports, blog posts, uh, webinars, and hopefully by the end of this year, uh, in-person events. Okay, excellent. 
Uh, another good question here. You've worked with a lot of, uh, you know, startup companies, early stage companies. Where can entrepreneurs find a mentor to help launch their business? What would you recommend? Around yeah, that? that's a great question. I mean, I think it's so key. Um, the first tip I would have is to consider building an advisory board for your company. So at Willful, uh, I actually was running my marketing agency when Kevin started it. So he really ran it basically on his own for the first year. He had no background in business at all. He was in trades. And so for him, it really was a bit of an uphill battle because he didn't have the traditional skill set that one would want going into building a tech company. But he was so passionate about the idea. It was one of those, I can't sleep, I have to do this business. So what he did was he built an advisory board. And what that's different from a board of directors, you know, the formal board that uh, that has legal liability. It's more informal, but it's a group of individuals who typically you compensate with some some options in your company. Um, but they basically are there to give you advice and you can make an advisory board that represents different skill sets. So we have someone on our advisory board that's great with digital product development, another person who's great with legal, uh, finance, et cetera. So you can basically look at your own skill set and complement that by bringing on advisors who uh, have a completely complementary skill set. So that's one way to do it formally is to actually build an advisory board, put them on your website, have monthly advisory board meetings where you're asking for their help. Um, the other way is just more informally to find a mentor. And to me, the best way to do that is just to treat it like a sales process, you know, make a list of the 10 to 20 people in your own community or elsewhere, because really you can find a mentor anywhere who have built a similar business uh, or otherwise have experience that you want to learn from. And then start the dating process, reach out, introduce yourself, ask first if you can have, you know, a 30 minute coffee, maybe you already know this person. And so you can broach the topic of mentorship. But if you don't, it's about getting to know them. If you just approach someone blind and say, hey, can you be my mentor? They're going to be like, wait, I don't, I don't even know you. So I want to get to know you and your business before I commit to that. Uh, but all of the mentors that I've had have just been organic like that, where I've reached out, hey, can we grab a coffee? Here's who I am. Here's what I'm looking for help with. We really appreciate your advice and what I found is that entrepreneurs are so generous even and business leaders who have reached some modicum of success in their career they tend to really prioritize mentorship giving back because when they were coming up in their career they also had mentors who were 10 20 years ahead of them so it really is this pay it forward mentality in entrepreneurship I find especially in the Canadian space because as you know we're just nicer and uh, we're definitely willing to go out of our way to help uh, and then there are also structured uh, platforms like 10,000 Coffees and others where you can actually, uh, there's one called Lunch Club where you can actually get paired with folks for, for networking. It's not necessarily for mentorship. Um, the only other thing I would say is to contact your local and regional accelerators or chambers of commerce because they, they typically have more formal mentorship programs uh, that you might be able to take advantage of. Great. I love seeing the engagement here. We got lots of questions rolling in. I want to be mindful of time. Um, what I'll ask this one, and it's something I guess we see at a fair bit with with BDC, where we're working with companies. But what would you say a business can do to start the process of creating an online persona? Great question, Aaron. Great name as well. Um, and I have to say thank you to Teresa also for saying my TikToks are fantastic. I'm a little embarrassed by them, but you know what? You got to put yourself out there. Uh, so the process of creating an online persona, um, Aaron, if you can pop in the chat, whether you mean personal or professional, I'm a big believer in when you're an entrepreneur, your personal brand really is your company brand. And so they're super, super intertwined. But if I was starting a business today, the, the main things that to me are foundational would be one to two social networks. I don't think you have to boil the ocean. I don't think you have to be on every single social platform. It's going to overwhelm you. Some of them are going to stay really out of date. Pick one or two, and those should match with your customer personas. If you're willful and your main customer is new parents, you're probably going to want to be on Instagram and Facebook. Uh, but if you're a B2B company and you're selling to lawyers, you probably want to be on, um, on LinkedIn, for example. Uh, then I would obviously have a website. I think a mobile friendly website is super key. Uh, maybe you're using something like Shopify, so you don't have to design that from the ground up. Uh, tools like Squarespace are really easy for that, but you do want that kind of hub that you can point people to. Uh, it doesn't have to be fancy though. It can really be a templated thing. Um, 
And then from there, I would think about reviews. So having some sort of place that you're directing your customers to uh, to leave reviews. We use Trustpilot at Willful. We also use Google reviews, but you can use Facebook reviews, um, however you want to do it. But to me, that social proof is really important. So when someone's Googling your business, they're finding your website, they're finding, uh, you know, a couple of those social channels, uh, but they're also finding what other people have said about you, which can be even more important than what you say about yourself. Great. Um, I, I wish we could continue taking questions here. I, I, I know our time's running down on the session and, and I'd like, love seeing the engagement, but uh, I, I think we need to wrap it up. And I, I just want to thank everyone for coming to listen to, to Aaron's keynote today. Uh, I think we can all agree it gave us a lot of great things to think about uh, and some incredible insight here as well. Um, so just, just for everyone, up next, we have some amazing breakout sessions uh, scheduled directly after I close this session. So two panels on continuous improvement uh, and lessons from the front line, as well as an LAE webinar. Uh, to select your session, head to the schedule in the right or in the top right-hand side of your platform page in the blue bar, and it'll bring you to a list of all today's scheduled sessions, keynotes, and presentations. Uh, we have some great sessions lined up for you, so please take advantage of the, of the scheduled presentations and keynotes. Uh, so for now, click on the schedule and, and go explore uh, what's to be offered on the on the summit schedule. But uh, uh, Aaron, I just want to thank you again. That was fantastic. I, I really loved all the questions coming in and the, the presentation was fantastic. So much appreciated. Thank you for uh, joining us here. Today. Danny, thank you so much. And thanks to the entire uh, Next team for, for having me today. I'm thrilled to be able to speak to other small business owners and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Great. Thank you. Thank you.